Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you um, for coming to my talk. In this talk, I will share some of the experiences we had building out um, a distributed concurrent write to Delta Lake um, in using Rust and formal formal verification methods. So a little bit about myself. I'm QP. I'm currently leading the core software team at Neuralink, where we help the company build a mass market high bandwidth brain computer interface. And formerly, I was uh, working as one of the tech leads at Script um, on the data and AI platform. And the work that I'm presenting here is a joint effort between me and my ex-colleagues, uh, Christian, Misha, and Tyler. Um, and in my spare time, I also work on a bunch of other open source projects, including Apache Arrow, so, uh, more specifically Data Fusion, which will have a um, really awesome talk here in the, in the same room um, at um, 5.30. So I highly recommend you attend. And obviously, I also work on Delta RS, which is what this talk will be mostly focused on. So uh, what is Delta RS? Um, on a quick high level, it is a full Delta Lake implementation in Rust. Um, in, and uh, the main use case for it is being able to easily access, read, and write access Delta tables um, without having a hard dependency on JVMs and Spark. Um, my previous boss, Tyler, gave a really cool um, overview talk of this project um, at last year's Data AI Summit. So I would recommend you um, checking out this talk if you want to learn more about the project. In this talk, I will only focus on um, how we implement um, distributed writes to the ta uh, Delta, Delta table on S3. So here's a, a quick agenda for the talk. Um, I will first go over what is Delta Lake to um, build in enough context for you to understand um, the remaining remain part of the talk. And then I will go over how we design and implement the concurrent write features in Delta RS and how we leverage formal revocation to help us um, build more confidence in the implementation itself. So Delta Lake 101. Um, in my opinion, the two biggest benefits that Delta Lake brings to the table um, over the tra traditional data warehouse is first, it adds this extra layer of asset um, transaction log layer to the data warehouse. So uh, this means that it's possible for you to have multiple readers and writers operating at the same, uh, at the same data, data table um, at once, and each of them will be getting a consist consistent view of the world. And the second benefit is you can use the same data source, the same Delta table as uh, both the batch and streaming data source, and which will greatly simplify your data warehousing design. So this is what a traditional data, wa data warehouse looks like. Uh, you basically just have a bunch of proc files living in a directory um, on a remote um, blob storage. And um, what Delta Lake adds to the top is um, a bunch of JSON files, which might not sound exciting, but uh, basically each JSON file represents a single commit to the table. And within that uh, JSON file, you will have a bunch, you will define a bunch of actions. And all of these actions will be considered as uh, atomically applied to the table, right? So, and the JSON file itself is named with a numeric uh, value, which represents the version of the table that uh, you're committing to. So in this particular example, we have a JSON file that includes three add actions. Um, each of them point to a three different proc files that contains the actual data that you want to write to this table. So let's say if I want to remove proc C and add a extra proc D file to the table, all you have to do is create another commit to the table um, through a JSON file. And within this JSON file, you can include two actions. The first is the remove action that will point to proc C. And then the other one is the add action that will point to proc D. And if, as the reader of this table, if you apply these transaction logs in the correct order, you will get a correct state of the table. In this case, the table will only contain proc A, B, and D files. So this is how Delta Lake uh, works at a really high level. Uh, I skipped a lot of tech technical details um, but, uh, for the sake of time, but this should be enough for you to understand what I will cover in, uh, for the rest of the talk. So one of the problems that you run into with this design is, what if you have multiple writers that's performing a write commit to the same table with the same version? Now, if we don't do anything special, um, let's say if we have three writers, uh, they will actually overwrite each other's commit, and we only one of them will actually go through, and then will result in a data loss. So um, the way that this is handled in upstream Delta Lake is we adopt a um, strategy call, called um, optimistic concurrency control, 
what this does is each writer will use a leverage a different put method called put if absent. This is something that's supported by most of the um, blob storage systems. And what this guarantees is it will perform two operations in uh, atomic click. The first operation is it will check whether the destination file already exists. If it doesn't exist, then the write um, operation will go through without any error. And if the destination file already exists, it will actually return an error back to the client. So in, in this case, let's say we have three writers. Um, all of them are using pull if absent, right? All of, only one of them will actually go through. And the other two will get back an error. So each writer will increment the version locally and try to get. So uh, again, because we have two writers, one of them, only one of them will go through, and the other, other one will get an error back. And then eventually, the last writer will increment to version three, and then all of the writes will go through. And in, with this approach, we won't have any um, uh, data corruptions. So th it, it is called op optimistic concurrency control because each writer, when they perform the write, they optimistically think that they were the only writer that's performing the write. So um, this works pretty well for workloads that does not have really high concurrent write um, to a data, data source. So it looks all really straightforward and um, to implement, but there's only one catch, with, which is uh, we are using S3. So S3 is actually one of the only major blob storage that does not support the semantic out of the box. So what I just said earlier would not work um, if you're using S3 like us. And uh, we have to come up with something else to, to make this uh, safe. So um, when we were thinking about this design, there are many two uh, directions. The first direction is to leverage, leverage DynamoDB, uh, which uh, provides a conditional write semantic, and we can basically use DynamoDB to store this JSON file um, commit. Right? So as a reader, what you do, would do is you will read the DynamoDB table to get the list of commits, apply them to get the current state of the table, and then you reach out to S3 to um, find, to read the um, parquet files that contains the actual data. Um, this is easy to implement, right? Um, because we get this put if absent operations uh, for free from DynamoDB. But the problem with this approach is it's not compatible with the rest of the pipeline. So all of your downstream pipeline has to adopt a, the exact same design. They will have to read through the DynamoDB first to, to get access to the commit log before they can read the actual data file. So this won't work for us. Our use case, because majority of our pipelines are still running um, in Databricks Spark, and they don't allow us to replace the Delta Lake uh, log implementation. So we have to keep using the Databricks Delta Lake implementation, which only reads the commit, commit log files from S3. So we ended up um, going with the second approach, which is to leverage DynamoDB to implement this pull if absent um, semantic on top of S3. So the benef of, benefit of this design is it's fully transparent and compatible with any open source or closed source Delta Lake reader, as long as they all read uh, the commit log and the data file from the exact same S3 bucket. So um, the first obvious idea that come to mind is to use DynamoDB as a distributed log. Um, we use this, for example, we can use this to guarantee that only a single writer can enter this critical region to add uh, commit to the table. Uh, this won't work because uh, if one of the writer crashed then, and while holding the log, then the whole system will basically pause and we won't be able to make any progress because if it crashed, then it won't come back online to re release the log um, for the other writers. So ne the next obvious idea is to add an expiration date to the log. Um, the, the idea being this is if the log writer crashed while holding the log, the log will eventually expire and then other writers will be able to acquire the same log and then keep making progress. Well, it turns out that this is also not gonna work uh, because expirable distributed log is a scam. Um, by scam, I really mean that if you're using a distributed log that has an expiring date set to it, you are basically providing zero guarantee to the critical region. And so it's actually not giving you any extra safety guarantees. So to demonstrate how this could go right, go, go wrong, um, here's the example. Let's say if one of the writer holds the log and it paused um, for whatever reason. So in distributed system, um, processes, processes can pause for arbitrary long of time 
um, due to many different reasons. For example, you might have um, high GC pressure, so the garbage collector can, can be taking up the whole CPU. Um, maybe another process, uh, processes are sharing the same CPU resource with you, and, or maybe you're under high memory pressure and you're going into swap mode. Um, or if you, know, you send a network packet and it got delayed and that never reached the destination. So uh, when we are modeling about distributed systems, we have to take this into account. And in, in this case, let's say the writer holds the log and it paused for a long period of time and it, until the log expired. So another writer will be able to acquire the expired log. And the problem that this caused is um, demonstrated in this timetable. Let's say at time zero, writer A acquired the log. At time one, um, it paused for a long period of time. At time T, the log expired. And then at um, T3, writer B comes in and acquired this expired log. At T4, writer A resumed. Let's say you know GC was happy now. And um, it, at time five, both of writer A and writer B will think that they are holding the log. And they are the only um, one who's in the critical region, which is clearly wrong. So um, the way that uh, we, we solve this problem is to exploit the fact that delta table commit is item potent, meaning the exact same commit um, to a delta table can be performed multiple times by multiple writers and we will not cause any data cor corruption to the table itself. And the way that we do this is when the writer tries to commit to a table, we first write out the commit content in a temporary location. And then what we do is, um, as a second step, we'll copy that temporary location to the final destination that we want to commit to. And um, we, when we try to acquire the log in DynamoDB, we atomically record this commit intention um, into the log itself. And so let's say if the log expired um, and get, got acquired by another writer, the other writer will be able to look at this um, recorded commit intention and perform the exact same operation on behalf of the original owner of the lock. And so here's a timetable of the, how this works in practice. Let's say um, time zero, writer A acquired the lock um, and record the same uh, commit intention to copy UIDA JSON to one.json. So one.json is the um, delta table version that we're trying to commit into. And at time one, Writer A paused for a long period of time, and time, T, uh, time two, lock expired. So when lock, uh, writer B tries to acquire this uh, lock uh, with its own commit intention, in this case, it, it's trying to commit uh, uidb.json into one.json as well. But then when he acquired the lock, it will notice that previously we have another, the previous owner recorded this um, intention to copy uida.json into one.json. So it will actually try, instead of performing its own commit, it will actually try to um, finish up the commit that was left um, by the writer A, which was the original owner of the lock. So let's say writer A resumed execution at T5. Um, it will keep doing the, performing the exact same commit, and it won't cause any problem because we just copy the, copying the exact same file from the temporary location to the final destination. And so um, you can see that at um, T7 and T8, both of them will release the lock. And lastly, the writer B will try to reacquire the lock um, with a newer version to try to um, put, commit its own data. So this way we can make sure that if a lock is acquired by a particular writer, um, that commit will always go through. So this works pretty well. Um, we actually had the full discussion um, in public on GitHub, which I don't know if it's a good idea, but you can find um, you can read, go through this discussion list and find about a lot of the stupid ideas I proposed initially. But um, it, it actually went really well in production. And um, we basically replaced our um, Spark ingestion layer with um, Delta RS uh, using a project called Kafka Delta Ingest, which a colleague Christian will be presenting here um, at the summit as well. So I highly recommend you um, taking a look. But uh, I don't want to steal his uh, thunder here. And we all, uh, as a side project, a product of this project, we also produced a reusable DynamoDB lock in pure Rust, um, which uh, Im implemented the, the exact same logic that we have here, but it can be reused across different projects. Um, big shout out to Misha for uh, doing most of the work for, for this um, library. And so 
things work really well, but there's something that always came back to me, which is I don't have the full confidence that we actually did everything correctly and we, we didn't uh, leave out any edge cases. So if you look at these um, kind of timetables, um, during the initial design process, we actually um, do, do this kind of action interleaving process, exercises manually, try to poke holes in the design and see if we can break the system. Um, it's pretty manageable when you have, you know, let's say two actors or three actors in the system. But once you add more actors into the system, it becomes um, impossible for a human to think through um, every possible state in the system. So what I've been thinking is, what if, if there is a way for us to use automation to automatically explore, explore all possible states in the system and help us find all the bugs that could exist? So this is where formal verification comes in. Now, formal verification might look, sound like a really daunting word um, or only used in academia, but actually we've been using verification, um, some sort of verification in our day-to-day -day practice. For example, if using a statically um, type-checked language, um, it, you are using software to automatically assert properties by enforcing type constraints to your code. If, using, if you're writing unit test, you are using unit test framework to assert properties by ma uh, making sure that input matches with output. Right? These are all some form of verification that we're doing today. They're, they're considered informal because they only test a really subset of the program behavior. So this is what formal verification brings to the table. Um, it actually can exhaust all possible state of the program and make sure that the program is correct in all circumstances. So um, there are many two approaches for uh, formal verification. One is called model checking, which is just simply automatically explore all possible state of the program. And for each state, it will go through a list of predefined properties, make sure that every single state will match this property. And the other approach is called um, deductive reasoning. And what this approach does, it, it is closer to actually writing mathematical proofs for your program. Um, in this particular talk, I want to focus more on model checking because I think this is a much more practical approach for software engineers. So here's an example of how um, state, state exploration works in practice. So um, going back to my previous example, let's say I have writer A and writer B. Um, at T0, writer A acquired the log at T1. Um, it paused for a long time. At T2, um, the log got expired. And at T3, writer B came in and it acquired the log. So you can see that the end state, um, state of this um, sequence is writer A will be um, holding a expired log and writer B will be also holding um, an expired log, right? So this is the end state of the system. Um, what you can do as a program automatically is to swap this to um, actions. Um, and then, you will, for example, you could have um, writer B to acquire the log at T2 before the log is expired. And then and you can set the log expiration, expiration at T3 step. So what we end up, then we will end up with, with a new state of the system. In this case, writer A will be um, holding an expired log, and then writer B will be in a state of failed to acquire um, the log. So, as a, so you can imagine that you can write a program to automatically interleave all these steps and make sure that we um, check for every possible state that the program can, can reach against a set of properties. So if you are familiar with uh, Model Checker, you probably have already heard of the project TLA+. Um, it is w widely adopted in the industry, and um, it's been used in AWS S3, um, Azure, Cosmos DB, and they all wrote papers about how they leverage TLA Plus to um, catch bugs in, in their design. So this was the first tool that I tried for, TLA, uh, for Delta RS. It um, worked reasonably well, um, but I ran, many ran into two problems. The first uh, problem that I ran into is it has a really steep learning curve. And um, because it, it, it is a TSL, uh, oh, sorry, it, it is a, D, um, D, you have to learn a DSL to be able to write proofs in it. And also, um, you have to learn a lot of different concept, concepts. So it took me actually a whole week to be able to write proofs productively uh, using TLA+. 
It has pretty rough tunings. Uh, you have to use a really he heavy we uh, weight um, job, JVM IDE to be able to write proofs and run, um, execute these proofs um, to perform the model checking. And lastly, I think this is the biggest problem to me is because you have to write the proof in a DSL, um, your implementation and proof are separated and you have to manually keep both of them in sync. So later on, I ran into a project um, online called State Write. Uh, this project took a really different approach at model checking. So at its core, it's doing very similar things like TLA plus, but the main difference is its design philosophy is to expose this model checking capability as a library instead of your, um, DSL. So because this is also written in Rust, you are able to um, just call a bunch of Rust APIs to define the model that you want to check against. And uh, it makes it a lot easier to get started for a Rust programmer like, like me. So here's what it looks like uh, in practice. Um, for those who are not familiar with Rust, trade in Rust is um, similar to other con concepts like interfaces or um, particles or abstract classes in other languages. But basically all you have to do is to write a struct that conforms to this uh, interface. So um, in here you can see that one of the methods you have to define is called a init state and it will return a list of states that a possible states that initial state that your, your program can start with. And then you have this actions method. You just define this method and it will take a state as an argument and you will return a list of possible actions that this state can perform. And next you have the next state method, which takes a state as an argument and action that you want to apply to the state. And it will return the, the next state that this um, program will be in. And lastly, you have this properties method, which um, lets you define a list of properties you want this program to satisfy at all time for at all possible states of the program. So this is pretty straightforward if you're familiar with state machines. So I took a step at it. It took me uh, about four to six hours to come up with a um, full proof of our um, distributed write implementation. And it's only about 500 lines of Rust code. So I would say it's a really productive um, experience for me. And so one of the nice benefit I mentioned earlier is because state write is uh, itself written in Rust. If your program also happened to be a Rust program, you can actually reuse your implementation um, as part of the proof if you can restructure your program into a state machine. Right? For example, state write also provides a really high level, uh, higher level abstraction for you to uh, model the, the design. And what this abstraction enables you to do is if you can write your implementation as an actor that basically just receive message and process the message and change its own state, then you can actually use the same code for the actual implementation and part of the proof. And so what you have to do is just write the code as an actor or a state machine, and then you define a separate set of properties, and automatically you'll be able to run through um, every possible state of, the, of your implementation against the um, predefined properties. Um, in every CI CD runs, and uh, you don't have to maintain two separate set of proofs and implementation, and you can make sure that they're always in sync. So this is a really powerful construct to me. So now goes to the important question, which is, is formal verification really worth it? Uh, I think the answer for, for me is yes, um, mainly for two reasons. So when we are writing the code, we are uh, using a really formal language, like the programming language itself, but we work at really low level uh, implementation details. And when we are thinking about the design from a high level, we're using natural language, which is not formal, to describe and reason about the system. So what formal verification, verification brings to the table is you're able to use a formal language to reason about the system at a high level. Right? This is something that we don't have during our day-to-day -day, um, software engineering process. So when you go through this process, it actually helps you clarify the thought and the design process a lot. And as you try to formalize the whole design using code, you actually find a lot of edge cases that you never thought about previously. So by just going through this process itself without even running the, autom running the automation, um, I actually found a, a bunch of design bugs in, in, the, in our design. So, so that was really helpful. And the other point is 
because we now have this automated state exploration process, um, we actually use it to run through our design and it actually caught a bug that all of us missed after we have shipped the product in production and has been running smoothly for a long period of time. So if you're interested in what kind of bug that we found using this approach, uh, I linked the GitHub discussion here. And um, so you can take a deeper look at this. So here is what the state write UI looks like. Um, and this is an actual screenshot of the bug that it found for Delta RS. Um, on the left side, you can see that there is a um, property section. This list a uh, set of properties I defined in my proof. And the green checkers means that this property um, was satisfied. And then the yellow sign means that this property was violated in this particular state of the program. So in the path of action sections, you actually list step by step of how this program enters into this invalid state. Right? So it's really easy for you to reason and uh, reproduce the bug if needed. And on the right side, uh, it is a detailed expansion of all the possible values, uh, all the values that's contained in a particular step or state of the program. So you can basically click through the, the path of ac action sections and um, deep inspect every single state of the program and try to follow through exactly how we get to the final in invalid state. And so the other thing that I want to add is it comes with a really nice UI, but you can actually run the whole um, state um, checking process in as a CLI tool, so as part of the CI/CD pipeline. So you can run through this, keep running this thing as you um, change the implementation of your program. But and but you can make sure that the proof is always in sync and the program implementation is always valid. So uh, this brings us to the last slide of the presentation, which is uh, I think the most important message I want to share with the audience. Um, historically, when we would try to build really efficient programs, we have to use low-level system programming languages like C and C++ because we want maximum control of, over the memory, right? And this usually means that it's more likely to introduce bugs because as, because you have more power over um, how to execute the program. And um, what I want to highlight here is it, we don't have to actually make the, this trade-off anymore if you have the right set of tools. For example, um, if you're using Rust, which is a low-level system pro programming language, but um, its type system guarantees that you will not have any memory um, safety bugs if you're not using unsafe code. So this means that you will not have any segmentation faults, you will not have any risk conditions um, if you're writing highly concurrent code. On the other hand, we can use formal ver verification methods to make sure that we don't have any logical bugs. Uh, logical bugs, it, I have asterisk here because um, the proof, it, uh, you can only eliminate logical bugs, all the logical bugs, if your proof is complete and correct. So there is a chance that your proof itself has bugs. In that case, then you, you might miss some of the logical bugs. But lastly, we, ha lastly, we have this um, library called state right. Um, and bridges the gap between these two methods, uh, toolings. So with state write, we can actually reuse the exact same implementation and, um, as part of the proof, so we can always keep them in sync. And to me, this is what really makes formal verification practical um, for high systems that requires you know, high performance, but also has a really tight safety um, and correctness, uh, correctness requirement. Um, with all that, that's all I have for the talk. And um, if you're interested in more dis discussing more about this um, project, feel free to comment um, on GitHub and um, on the Delta RS project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, TP. Uh, so we do have um, a bit of time for some questions. But whilst you're all thinking about your questions, uh, you mentioned about getting in contact. What is the best way for people to get in contact with you? So uh, just go to github.com slash delta dash io, and then you'll find the Delta RS project. You can just leave um, comments in the issues or um, discussion page. Awesome, thank you so much. Do we have any questions from people in the audience? 
Okay, uh, so the people at home can hear you. I'm going to run towards you very awkwardly. I'm a nerd, not a sports person, uh, so they can hear you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you are supporting, everything that you have shown is supporting on uh, AWS S3 uh, storage. Are you planning on supporting other uh, cloud vendors as well? Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, S3 is the only blob storage that does not support Prolif Absence out of the box. For GCPs and Azure, we already have um, that supported. So Delta R is already supported, uh, is already leveraging the, the na na native Prolif Absence uh, operation. So we just get this um, save commits for free. Great. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about more the ingestion part, right? You mentioned that you, you provided with the uh, uh, ingest, Kafka uh, ingest, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just to repeat that. So uh, that's for the Kafka ingest as well. Sorry. Yes. So um, my colleague, ex colleague Christian, he will be giving a Kafka Delta ingest talk here in the same sub summit. So uh, because it's leveraging the same Delta RS libraries, we basically get. Um, those for free for other blob storage, but there's minor change that we have to change on the uh, ingestion service side to actually use those co path. But um, if you're interested in contributing, feel free to um, participate in the project. It's also an open source project um, in the Delta IO um, team organization. How can you be sure using state right? to verify that all permutations of the potential state operations, especially distributed across multiple writers, could be fully accounted for? Uh, so statewide will actually export all the possible states in the system, right? So uh, as part of the modeling, you will have to specify what are the possible states in the system and what are the possible actions for each state and how does it perform the state transition. So you, once you define this set of properties, it will actually go through all possible states and verify all of them against the properties you want the program to satisfy. Okay, so it's a, it's a manual verification of the permutations that are potentially available that state right would then guarantee that each one of those are t tested, correct? I would say it's an automatic validation, but it, you have to first step is to manually define, spec out the system. But like I said earlier, if you actually implement the system as a state machine, then you don't have to do the extra step. You get the spec for free, right? Any more questions? Oh. Um, did you look at all at uh, using something like Jepson also to? to yes. So Jepson, it's in a different camp. Um, it's I wouldn't call it formal because it does not ex explore all possible state, but it's also a really useful tool that you can use to. Like it's really good because it's good in the sense that you don't have to formally spec out the system, so it will actually work for any software that does not have a formal spec, right? So it's more like a backbox uh, testing. Yeah. So I, I do recommend you try apply all of these uh, methods to make sure that the system is correct. Because like I said earlier, there could be a bug in your uh, formal um, specification as well. Uh, I'm data procedure. Uh, and we are using the Delta as a file system. So uh, is there any way to use those kind of transaction in those system? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question, uh, the last part? Uh, I mean, uh, it seems like uh, we can do safe transaction through the Delta. Yes, uh, we, we can perform safe rights to, um, yes, to the yeah. tables. So, so is there any way, uh, way to use it in the data, uh, Databricks platform, I mean. Yeah, yeah so uh, we are actually using this. Oh, so you, uh, like I said earlier, right, so this, the design that we come up with is fully compatible with Databricks uh, runtime. So whatever tables that's created using Delta RS will, will be readable as, um, from downstream Databricks jobs. So what, what we do as script is we want, run these ingestion daemons in um, AWS ECS. And then all the tables that were created by these ingestion daemons will be read by Databricks jobs downstream. And you don't have to change anything. It should just work out of the box. Thank you. All right, that is all we have time for today. So I want to say a big thank you to QP. If we can give him another round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you.